Futurize goes beneath the trends to track the underlying forces of disruption in tech, policy, business models, social dynamics, and the environment. I'm your host, Shwanana Unheim, futurist and author. In episode one of the podcast, the topic is how can corporates reignite the entrepreneurial spirit? Our guest is Steve Eppner, who teaches corporate entrepreneurship at St. Louis University and was the entrepreneur in residence at Boeing. Okay, so we are on Futurize. I'm here today with our guest, Steve Eppner. Steve, how are you doing today? I am doing so good, it's probably illegal. <laughs> so Steve Eppner is my distinguished guest today, and we will talk about uh, a lot of things. But let me first bring out uh, some things uh, that Steve has done in his career. So you've published something about nine books you told me correct one of them we will talk about in detail for sure which is uh, simplify everything um you've made something like 350 professional presentations you have been working at boeing uh for a while we'll talk about that very interesting company an interesting role there uh, and you're an academic um so you are now teaching on corporate entrepreneurship and and related issues so so that's uh, very interesting too Tell me a little bit about how you got there, Steve, before we get into anything else. So it's an interesting path. <clears throat> I started out working for large corporations, as most of us did out of school in the 60s and 70s. And I spent time with Union Carbide, Monsanto, and Citicorp. And then I decided, you know, if I was going to work that hard, I could do it for myself. So I decided to quit and try starting my own business in 76, and that ran for like 38 years. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. But then I tried retiring, and that was very difficult. I was so used to being engaged at a very high level that not having a lot to do was very disturbing. And I got very lucky, a little company you mentioned before, Boeing, uh, came looking and recruited me. They wanted to create an entrepreneur in residence position to try and reignite the entrepreneurial spirit within the company of Boeing. And so I was given a great deal of leeway. Uh, I was asked to come up with 100 new business ideas a month, which, by the way, was the easy part. But then we were also asked to come up with two a year that we could actually turn into actual businesses. And so that was really exciting. At the same time, when I first thought about retiring in my 50s, I went back to school, got a master's degree so that I could teach and help create this program called Corporate Entrepreneurship, which is how to be innovative and entrepreneurial within an existing company as opposed to starting your own business. And as a result of that, we also set up a program called SLU Start. So I teach at St. Louis University. And SLU Start is a program we offer free to the community. You don't have to be attached to the university in any way to help people who want to start their own businesses. Right. And it so has you are been both, just fantastic. You are both engaged on the corporate side for them to reignite. And and I think one of the conversations we had, Steve, was you corrected me because I said, how can corporates ignite the entrepreneurial spirit? But you reminded me that it's, of course, the topic today is how can corporates reignite the entrepreneurial spirit? Uh, tell me more about that. <clears throat> well, we know that every corporation was entrepreneurial or they wouldn't have gotten started. But what happens is too often they become good at doing something and they keep getting better and better at doing that thing and they forget about entrepreneurship until they're suddenly hit in the side of the head with a two by four, new competition, new technology, whatever, and then it's a scramble. We're trying to get them to think about that in advance and not make it so disruptive in their own organization. Can we peel that onion back a little bit? Because I'm fascinated by this. It's so easy to sort of say, yes, corporates are not innovative. But, but like you said, they were once. Many of them were. How 
How does one forget to be innovative? Is it purely a question of scale? I mean, the larger you become, now you're bureaucratic. Or is it more complicated than that? Because I feel like the study of becoming entrepreneurial is, you know, is one topic, but the study of how companies became complacent, I guess, is a much more boring story and less explored. Well, it's a very exciting story, actually. Um, there's one big difference I want you to think about, and that is the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship. Innovation is coming up with new ideas, new techs, new ways of doing things. Entrepreneurship is about doing something with it. So the classic example that we use in class is Kodak. Kodak was so sure that you would never replace paper and film in photography that they never went after digital photography, which was a big mistake. It put them out of business. Right. The only reason they're still in business is their innovation center is the one who invented digital photography. You can't make a digital camera without paying a royalty for their patents. And yet internally, they couldn't see this as a positive innovation. The Kodak story fascinates me on, on, on many different levels. I mean, you, you may know this. I mean, I d just recently published a book about failure, which is a very complicated thing because when do you ever fail? I mean, one thing that I, I'm reminded about with Kodak is just the sheer number of patents that they developed. So from, from you know, in, in most respects, they, of course, were a failure and they failed to foresee the future and certainly failed to apply some of their own learnings. But on the other hand, they are such a treasure trove of innovation that remains to this day in, in the form of, of patents. How, how, how do you reconcile those two? Well, what happens is the corporate higher-ups are so focused on protecting their current business that they're afraid to do anything that might steal from it. So Kodak's thought process was, well, if we push digital cameras, that's going to reduce our film business. We better stay away from that because film is where we make our money. And yet by ignoring it, they lost out on the film business and they could have been the leader in digital technology. But they're not the only one. I mean, the other story that's become very well known in academic circles is the idea of the um, quartz uh, watch. It was actually invented by the Swiss watchmakers, but because they didn't believe anybody would ever wear a watch that didn't have wind up and springs and gears, they didn't even patent it. They just showed it off as a toy at a watch congress, and pretty soon Texas Instruments of America, Seiko of Japan, basically went home and ran with it, and over time, the Swiss lost about 60% of their watchmakers. So it's not just Kodak, it's not just Americans, it's when you become so invested in what you know how to do well that you ignore everything that's happening, that you are setting yourself up for trouble. Tell me more about that, Steve, because isn't that something that happens to all of us? When we become good at something, we become recognized for being good at that. Isn't it a natural human tendency, certainly at the individual level to, I mean, not just become complacent, but you're so proud at a certain stage about what you're, you've accomplished and you get certain accolades. It's, it's very easy to fall into this trap, isn't it? And I'm, um, you know, let's, let's talk about some more modern examples. I mean, if you, if you were to look into companies today where you see the signs that they could start to become complacent just right about you know right about now i mean what, what companies come to mind if we were just going to put a crystal ball uh you know to the test here what are some companies that are going to have to be really careful right now either because they're so successful with a very given thing that's not going to last or because you already start seeing signs that there are some newcomers doing different things you have some ideas well, there, there are a bunch of ideas. One of the companies that I worked with recently um, makes checkbooks. Well, people are writing fewer and fewer checks, and they're trying to figure out right now, what do they do with what they know how to do well? And it's become a big question. 
The other thing, though, that I'd like to add to the comment you just made a moment ago is I think as human beings and as business owners, we become protective. It's not necessarily that we're complacent, but we're protective. We want to protect what we have and we're not willing to risk it. I mean, I've seen this in just startups. I work with hundreds of startups every year. And what happens is you read about these people who were almost in the gutter. They had nothing and they became famous and they made some great breakthrough. I think one of the biggest challenges is that person is not protective of what they have and they commit 100% of their life to moving forward. What happens is you get many middle class idea generators, but they've got a nice job. They've, they've got a nice life and they say, well, this is a good idea. I'm going to work on it part time. And they never make the commitment. And I think that's one of the reasons that they never succeed at the level that they could. Well, certainly commitment to your idea and project is, is, is an important one. But I, I wanted to kind of dig a little bit more into what you're saying. It's very easy to assume that every startup is very innovative and far more innovative than larger entities can be. Have you found that to be true uh, overall? Or would you say that, I mean, there, because you could also say it's an unfair advantage to be a startup at a certain point, at least when you get some funding, because you have a fresh start. You have people who have no vested interest in legacy business models and you know you're all in on on something new so all your money is going theoretically in the right direction and you have you know fresh eyes on on a lot of things now is it always the case that startups are able to capitalize on the novelty and on the fresh start or would you say that there are times when you work with startups because i certainly know that there are times when i've worked with startups when i have found that Yes, of course, they are innovative. But even for startups, there's differences within how much they're able to capitalize on that n newness. And, and, and then, of course, after a little while, now there's another startup. And they, you know, you, all you have is six months lead time on, on, on that startup. And, you know, so there's competition <laughs> even among startups. What, what's your reflection on, on innovation speed within the startup community? What is it that separates the, the winners from the losers or, the, or basically the internal sort of innovation dynamics within the startup? Well, I think we've got to be careful about saying winners and losers. Obviously, if you don't stay in business, you haven't done things that are right. But then you look at somebody like the guy who came up with Pet Rocks, okay? He was only in it for two years, but he cleared enough millions. He didn't ever have to work again the rest of his life. So was he a loser? I don't know. Was he innovative? I think so. So I think we have to be a little careful in how we describe that. But, you know, it's just like you asked me a question a minute ago. Did I see any of the Kodaks on the horizon? And this maybe will help with the conversation because think about office furniture. COVID-19, or yeah, COVID-19 has sent so many people working from home, who's going to buy new office furniture? Everybody's talking about, well, in this new economy, we can all work from home. So if I were making office furniture right now, I think I'd be looking very carefully, what's next? Where should I be? Should I be creating pods that can be used in homes to work from? Well, maybe that's where it's going to be, or maybe... Office furniture is like buggy whips. It's just going to go away. Uh, and I think what happens is people then circle the wagons and they don't want anybody to tell them that this may be the end and they will keep making their buggy whips until they go out of business. It's a delicate balance, isn't it, between Very. listening to advice from, uh, you know, listening to the market and taking signals and listening to advice from whether it be mentors or, or formal kind of boards and things, and, and just also going your own way and doing something independently. I wanted to, I wanted to bring this for a second back to, to Boeing because, I mean, it's a fascinating, massive company, aerospace company, defense, space, and security um, place that you've worked at. And you came there fairly late in your career. What, are, what were some of your initial observations when you landed in Boeing? Well... 
First of all, you have to understand <clears throat> that some 38 years earlier, I had dropped out of large corporations to start my own company. And I defined a large corporation as any group of two or more people. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, right. obviously, I, when, when I finally left my company, we had over 200 people. So I had gotten right. over that. But I was surprised at the amount of administrivia that a large company has. And, and of course, even a company my side had a lot of administrivia, but it was easier to deal with when you're at the top. You know, so coming into a new organization uh, with 176,000 employees and knowing that even though I was at the top of the, let's say, non-vice presidents, I was as high as you could get without being a vice president, there was still a lot of people above me and they all loved to push paper. You know, they, they protected everything. Yeah. And I understand that, you know, it was difficult because Boeing had a reputation for safety and security and they don't take risks. They don't make mistakes. Uh, and we'll leave the 737 out of this. And so trying to go in and create an environment where it's OK to take a risk and it's OK to have a failure because you have to if you're going to be entrepreneurial was really, really difficult. And those people who had been inside the organization for a long time just had a hard time understanding that and coming to grips with it. Well, I mean, talk about a tall order, right? You're, you're asking a aerospace company laser focused on security and not making mistakes to essentially be prepared to individually make a lot more mistakes. Because that's Correct. what risk and failure is, right? It is pushing that right. risk boundary to where you fail. And then obviously benefiting from the lessons from the recovery, really, in a, in a certain sense. So t what was day one like? I mean, you sat down, you're like, okay, I'm taking this challenge on. What do I tell these people? Well, day one, I had to figure out how to get into the building. <laughs> you know, when, <laughs> they wouldn't when, let you when, in. Well, they shouldn't you let you in, actually. They shouldn't have let you in, but they did. Correct. But, you know, there's a lot of security. And within Boeing, uh, there are certain projects that are going on that you can't even carry a phone in or your computer out. Uh, you uh, report to work. You go through all kinds of security measures. And you go into your room where you're going to work and nothing in there is allowed to come out and nothing from the outside is allowed to go in. And they're working on some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so that's got to be very difficult for your normal run of the mill entrepreneur who's willing to go out and try anything. Uh, so you have to be extremely careful there. But the other thing that I found was I, I was very lucky. Uh, Tim Noonan was the vice president that I uh, reported to. And Tim knew that entrepreneurship and innovation was going to require a slightly different mindset. So one of the things he did, we have an area in St. Louis that's called the cortex section of town. And it's all about innovation and trying new things. And so he was able to get permission from Boeing to take our group <clears throat> and move us down to Cortex. We had an office that was like none else anywhere within the corporation. Matter of fact, uh, John McDonald, who's the uh, one of the largest shareholders, and obviously he was the president CEO of McDonnell Douglas before Boeing bought him, came into our office one day and he looked around and he said, is this Boeing? Uh, everything was movable. We could move the chairs, the desks. We had portable whiteboards. We had portable monitors. And we had electricity came down from the ceiling like you were in some kind of factory. But we could create an environment. We could do a classroom for 50 or we could create little pods for four people to work at a time. And it became famous within the company so that people wanted to come down to our place to work on special ideas, to work on special projects, 
because we completely changed the atmosphere and that helped change the mindset. So you changed the atmosphere after a while and you changed some processes and you built a physical space or spaces to do so. What would you say were some of the accomplishments from that? Because so far, you know, it's about sort of processes. What, what were some of the more tangible benefits you felt stemmed from from that kind of new activity? Well, I think people started thinking and expanding their thought process. And uh, yeah, understand, I did not have a security clearance. So the things that I was shown are, are not secure. And so I can talk about some of them. But people started thinking outside the box. Now, not everything could be done. And I'll just tell you quickly about one that we didn't act on at the time. But you've heard of the, the Hindenburg, you know, the old dirigibles filled with hydrogen. And yeah. they were Exciting like project, a big ship. But gone, gone wrong. <clears throat> gone wrong. So some of the engineers said, hey, what if we don't have as much hydrogen? What if we have a more protective skin? But we've got to still lift a lot of weight. So what happens if we create the envelope in the shape of an airfoil and then put forward thrust on it? And we don't need just gas to lift it, but we've got thrust over an airfoil that creates lift and would pick it up off the ground. That wow. was a great idea. Yeah. Now, for many reasons, among them cost and getting approvals and proving that this would have the ability to make money down the road, we didn't go forward with the project. But I think getting people to think like that was a big benefit. And in some of the other projects that are not public and people can't talk about, I like to think that those engineers suddenly had a new appreciation for thinking outside the box. because. As my position, I was allowed to talk to all the engineers and scientists and encourage them to come in and think about new things and to suggest new ways of doing things. And it was very exciting. Uh, I, I can tell you, if I may, uh, one other thing that uh, is actually an ongoing project at the university now, at, at Washington University, uh, we had invited students to come in and utilize patents and see if they could create anything that had nothing to do with airplanes, defense, space, or security. Hmm. And these kids are brilliant. And we have cameras, which you might imagine, you can sit in satellites or drones or whatever you want to call them. And they are rumored to be able to count the teeth in your mouth from a mile away. Okay, I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it's a nice story. Right. And there are special cameras that look down at Earth, and they are being used now in agriculture because we can use what's called phenotyping to look at plants, and we can tell whether they need water, whether they need nitrogen, whether they might have a bug infestation, and we can help control the growth of crops anywhere in the world without having to be on site all the time. Well, the students looked at this and they said, you know what, that's really interesting. What if we could see other things using these special cameras? And one of the students wanted to become a oncologist and a surgeon. And it turns out that if you take a tumor out of somebody's body, before you're allowed to sew them up, you've got to send samples of tissue from around where you cut to make sure you have what they call clean margins. And you send it down to pathology and they look at it. And until they come back and say it's clean, you can't sew up the patient. And if they find some more cancer cells, you have to cut more and then do another set of tests. Well, the kids said, what if we use one of these cameras and we program it to look for cancer cells? Then we could have the surgeon basically take a picture, the computer would analyze it and could tell you whether the margins were clean in a matter of seconds Fascinating. instead of taking minutes. Hmm. Okay. They've, they've now tested this and they've been able to identify a couple different kinds of cancer cells. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's a fascinating thought. 
but it took somebody with the instruction that you can't do anything that relates to military or aircraft. Right. And they took stuff that's already there and looked at it with a new set of eyes. So I love working. Isn't that interesting that you just looked with a new set of eyes? Because so many times we think of innovation as, uh, or disruptive innovation as everything about it is disruptive. But as you pointed out, you know, even if you look at, look at, you know, a concept like improvisation in music, what I've understood more and more, uh, you know, from doing it myself is that you, you are using and reusing structured patterns that are not really very innovative at all. In fact, the innovation happens at the margin. But in order to make that innovation happen, you have to kind of coordinate so that everybody really knows what's doing, what they're doing. And then that improvisation, that novelty happens in those seconds where you see, oh, it's needed right here. So it's not like everything is innovative. And, and, I, and I love that thought. I love your example because it's not like they had to innovate everything. They had to put a camera, which is an existing technology, in a new place and record some new stuff and put in place a new process. That's sometimes innovation. It's not like you have to redo the whole thing and start with, you know, uh, the beginning of, uh, uh, you know, of a chemistry experiment. Right, right. And it also allows you to move very quickly to create new things. And I mean, it's fascinating. If, uh, I've studied this <clears throat> and uh, one of my favorites is a toy, really. A friend of mine who happens to be a percussionist was at a percussionist convention, which he says can give you headaches, whether you believe it or not. And he saw a musical instrument that a guy had developed, and it was called a spring drum. It was about 18 inches in diameter, had a drum head on the bottom, and a spring that looked like a snare spring from a drum hanging from it. And when you swirled it, it made a thunder sound. Wow. Well, Robert Fishbone, who's my friend, said, hey, I'd love to sell those. And the guy who had invented it basically said, look, I'm already making 70 or 80 a year. I'm selling to all the philharmonics and symphonies. I don't need any competition. So Robert said, how about if I only sell to non-professional musicians? And the guy said, fine, do it. Just send me a 10% royalty. Right. So Robert went home made it small enough that you could hold it in one hand, just a cardboard tube, put an artificial drum head at the bottom, hung a spring from it, renamed it a thunder tube, and in his first year in business sold over a hundred thousand. Fascinating. Fascinating. So what was the innovation? You know, he took something that somebody else had invented and couldn't see it as a toy because they only saw it as a musical instrument. He saw it as possibly being a toy, sells it through all kinds of uh, like museum shops and uh, uh, toy stores. And he made more money on the royalties for the small toy than he did ever for making the big ones that he sold for a lot of money to the orchestras. You know, it, it's so fascinating because, you know, in, in some of my work, I, I look at the various tools that are available for for corp for any innovation, but especially for corporate innovation, and I, and they will all be familiar to you. And I call it kind of the social biosphere of innovation. But you know, anything from the very basic, which is you know, a core product innovation, to the stuff that you're talking about, which is starting to do either spin outs uh, or you know, partnering with so startup partnerships or having your know, innovation unit kind of look at new things, or even just strategizing about new things, uh, t- two things like corporate venture fund and truly investing in outside innovation. Uh, and of course, the, the, the usual sort of like internal R&D lab activity. So now these are like eight different types of, of, of uh, activities that the Dream Corporation all has going on. But in reality, you know, in the real corporation, and I'm, I'm sure even in Boeing, but certainly in smaller companies, you don't either you don't have all of that or you could even have all of those elements but they're not connected in a meaningful way and and it's really hard and i want to hear your view on this i mean the, this patchwork of innovation that exists in every company 
Is there a point in trying to coordinate it or is there really no telling which of those elements are going to be important? So, you know, whether you are the manager of innovation or you're just a person trying to be innovative in a, in a large corporation, how do you, how do you, if at all, keep track of all of these aspects or shouldn't you keep track? Like, and, you know, where would you spend your time if you had to start over now and you were a young person entering a corporation? Would you go through the motion and spend your time in all of these various business units? Or would you pick one of them and say, this is where all the action is? Uh, is it possible to determine those kinds of things at the outset? Boy, if I could determine those things at the outset, I would probably own my own island somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a gamble. And one of the things that keeps the average person from being a corporate entrepreneur is they're not willing to take risk. They got a cushy job, don't rock the boat, and entrepreneurs and innovators take risks, whether you're at a Boeing or, or wherever. And um, we have uh, different people. I have an organization I run here in St. Louis called the St. Louis Innovation Roundtable. And we have the innovation executives from companies like Express Scripts, and Boeing, Monsanto, now Bayer, uh, Anheuser-Busch, and listening to the stories of how their greatest innovations have come about is absolutely amazing. And there is almost no commonality except for willingness to take a risk, and I would say teamwork. I don't know very many lone um entrepreneurs, innovators that make big things. Everybody works with a team if you're going to do something significant, especially in a larger corporation. Not everyone can do everything. And I think that's important for people to understand. But you have to be willing to take some risk. You have to be willing sometimes to bend the rules. You got to be willing to try things that aren't always sanctioned, but do it in a safe way. And that is very hard for young people, especially to get their arms around. Now, at my stage of life, you know, when I went over to Boeing, I didn't care. I mean, there was no such thing as risk. What's the worst thing that could happen? They were going to fire me? Yeah, like, who cared? I'd already retired. Uh, so I was able to actually push the envelope and I think create things that otherwise would not have been done. So that's, you had an unfair advantage in a certain sense. And I, I, I want to get to that yes. because I think so many people, <laughs> when we think about risk, we think about it as something that we can fathom and sort of make a rational decision around. But in reality, you know, these things are pretty stable. If you are a risk seeker or a sensation seeker, that's what you are. It's not something you can really become very easily? Or, or, or is it? I mean, let me test something with you. So if I say, um, you know, let's teach someone to become more innovative or more disruptive. And, and, you know, we have gone through some of the things that you have to do. So first you have to get exposed to disruption in some way, right? You have to either go to a place or, or somewhere where something disruptive is, hap is happening, or you have to, you know, put two and two together and start doing something that's slightly new. And then you have to take or simulate or at least expose yourself to this, to some kind of risk by doing something that hasn't been attempted before in that particular configuration. But now comes the third sort of move that I see. And, and how do you teach that to people? And I know that you teach entrepreneurial spirit. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, I have my own ideas about this, but it's not easy. Persisting until the point of failure and, and truly going there, really, experiencing what it might mean to fail deeply, irrevocably sometimes, if, unless you're you in, in, you know, in that role at Boeing. If you're younger, it does have a consequence. That Correct. Sometimes you, you do get fired. Sometimes you definitely lose a lot of money or resources, or certainly there's lost opportunity. Ha! How do you motivate people to do that? Because the founder personality, if you can speak of it that way, they kind of have that. Or would you say so, they don't and they just, they're just pushing themselves to that point anyway? So, 
So the thing is, uh, there's a guy, uh, an author out there named Adizes. I don't know if you've ever read any of his work, A-D-I-Z-E-S, who I happen to like. And he looks at personalities of people. Are they short-term thinkers? Are they long-term thinkers? Are they risk-takers? Are they not risk-takers? Are they interested in output? Are they interested in process? And he helps you look at a team and you need to have a diverse team to really be successful at getting outside the box. Because if you only have people with, let's call it future vision, and they want to create a transporter beam, and they get focused on that, and there's nobody to bring them down to earth, they're going to go off and never accomplish anything. But if you have somebody who can bring them down to earth and say, hey, What can we do to approximate this? Well, then all of a sudden you can start creating things that really work. And so number one, I'd say you need a team of people that you can bounce ideas off of. Number two, you need to convince people that they are creative. Now, one of the exercises I do, I run a number of adult classes for the university. And when people come in, there's a whole lot, well, I got to come take this, but you know, I'm not really creative. So the first thing I do is I put everybody in small groups and they only get 60 seconds. Well, this right away scares them. Mm. And I give them 60 seconds and each group must come up with 10 new ideas for Kleenex. That's all the instruction I give them. And they're sort of like deer in the headlight. And all of a sudden I say, guys, if you don't start working, you're not going to get this done. And the room explodes into noise. And all these people start putting together ideas and they're throwing out some really stupid stuff. And I'm celebrating all of the stupid ideas. I mean, this is what happens. And then when we get done and all of a sudden there are a hundred new ideas for something as simple as Kleenex and they came up with them, they start to think, well, maybe I can be creative. Maybe there's something to this. And that's step one. You've got to have confidence in your own ability before you can have confidence to do something big. I think that's fascinating. And I, and I want to go to something different in a second, but let's just talk about what I think is sort of like the the fourth move, because you said you have to have the confidence and of course you have to have that. But what about when you do realize that these ideas are mostly stupid? What if you don't get to those hundred great ideas or your team didn't, but some other team did? How do you reflect and recover from the necessary edge of innovation where you, like in science and in any other worthy pursuit, there's a lot of, and I don't want to call it failure. Apparently people don't like this term, but you know, you experiment and you have to pivot because things are slightly different from what you thought. But anyway, you have to kind of prepare your next move and you have to do it differently the next time. How do you teach people to reflect around that and what what is the acceptable sort of recovery time i mean some of these things are are like we said they're costly you 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 either fail or it costs resources you can't do it exactly the same the next time and maybe that's the lesson right i mean if you spent all your money on a product that failed the next product you're going to be really scrappy and maybe that's a good thing or vice versa uh, you know you don't have resources for your first uh, product and then you realize well, I failed because I needed triple the resources. So, you know, if I'm going to go through with this, I need the investment first. So h- how do you well, help but people this reflect? Is where you have to be willing to create a minimally viable prototype. That's what we teach the students. You know, mock something up. And then we go out and do customer discovery. And I don't want to sound like a professor here, but it's sometimes hard not to. <laughs> if I was advising everybody that's listening that wanted to be entrepreneurial and be innovative, identify some people to talk to. We call this customer discovery. And ask them about their problems. Matter of fact, we teach, instead of brainstorming, we teach painstorming. And uh, this is my thing, and I, I haven't quite copyrighted it, but it's going to be in my next book, so it will be copyrighted shortly. And that is people pay to make pain go away. So if I can get somebody describing 
a pain that they're having. And it can be processing, it can be product. Who cares? If they will say to me, and these are the two words I listen for, I wish. If I hear those two words, I know whatever they tell me next is going to be pure gold. And that is something worth trying to innovate on. But then you have to look at the population and see, is this just a one-off? Is this one person who wants it and nobody else? Or can you then do some research and identify that this is something that could really take off? And that's what we try to teach our students. And that's what we do in Slew Start. We get people to take their first idea, try it on potential customers, and let the customer take you to where you have to go to make that pivot to find the right answer. Let me push you a tiny bit on that, though, Steve, because I I agree with you. Customer discovery is important. But isn't it also true that some of the absolutely greatest product innovations in recent time and many times uh, some of the Apple products and Steve Jobs has taken as kind of evidence of this, they weren't directly a result. They were at least abstracted from, from direct customer discovery. Of course, Apple was doing customer discovery, but what they in, in the end produced, it couldn't have been a directly derived product from talking to any one individual customer. Isn't it also true that you have to do some of your own thinking here? Oh, absolutely. So if you took and said to people uh, 15 or 20 years ago, whenever it was, I think you need an iPod. You could never have proved that that was something that the people wanted and would sell. But what happened, and I'm making this up now, but in my own mind, I see Steve Jobs talking to people and they're saying, oh, these MP3 players are so tough to use. I wish there was an, that's the words, I wish there was an easy way to listen to music. And that's the kind of thing that got him taking the MP3 player, which was not a new invention but changing the human interface to make it easy, which was. Steve, this is fascinating. I'm I'm getting a lot of ideas here about not only how to teach entrepreneurship to, you know, anyone, but also, you know, how to apply this to my own life and my own experience and and come up with other business ideas. But before we sort of bring this to a close, I wanted to touch on on this. You are a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Tell us more about that. Well, first of all, I've always been fascinated with magic. But in my role as an innovator and entrepreneur, there are two things that I think have helped me. One is magic because it forces you to think differently. Okay, so logically, I I do one illusion where I pull a rope through my neck. Logically, I can't do that. But it looks so real, the average person just goes, oh, my gosh, how would you do that? Of course, I don't tell them, but I learned to use human nature and understand where people are looking, where they might be distracted, what are eyes attracted to, what are people attracted to, and how can I think differently than everybody else? The second thing that I do is improv, and you actually said this earlier in your introduction. I think that if you want to be an innovator, you know, join an improv group, even if it's only for a weekend, even if it's only for, uh, you know, a few lessons. But what happens is you learn to think quickly and you learn to think with a team. Because like one of the exercises they put us through is you got to tell a story where everybody adds one word to the story. Well, you got to start to be thinking about where are we going, but you also have to pay attention. You have to listen carefully to get the word that's going to be said right before you have to add a word. It's, it, it forces you to really learn to concentrate. So I would say uh, pick things that you like. But for me, magic and innovation uh, just go together, you know, better than almost anything else you can think about. And improv helps you think. I love that, Steve. Look, this has been a fascinating conversation. So it's about simplifying everything down to its uh, little little bits, but it's also about remaining uh, sometimes in the domain of magic and uh, and learning from improvisation and a lot of different experiences. For sure, your uh, 
you know, your innovation life has been a set of lots of different uh, experiences and you have, must have taught a lot of entrepreneurs in, in your day. I certainly learned a lot. Thank you so much for spending time with us here on Futurized on learning a little bit more about how corporates and anybody can reignite their entrepreneurial spirit. Thanks, Steve. You have just listened to episode one of the Futurized podcast with host uh, Trunana Unheim. And the topic was how can corporates reignite the entrepreneurial spirit? Our guest was Steve Eppner, who teaches corporate entrepreneurship at St. Louis University and was the entrepreneur in residence at Boeing. My takeaway is that entrepreneurial spirit is a bit about magic, which forces you to think differently, and a bit about improvisation, but mostly learned by exposure to risk and a willingness to take that risk. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, subscribe at futurized.co or in your preferred podcast player. Futurized, prepare you to deal with disruption.